Good afternoon, everyone. We're just at about three o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. This is our last lecture of the series, our last lecture of the academic year. So we won't be back again until September. So we're going to go out with a bang today with one of our one of our favorite presenters, Dr. DeCaven. Um, in the meantime, though, thank you all for joining us this spring. We've really enjoyed being back here at Fairhaven Senior Services, and we'll be back again in September. Again, I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater, and we host the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services and have been doing so since 1983. So thank you for having us back every year. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Richard Haven is a Professor Emeritus of Communication at UW-Whitewater. He is one of the 135 scholars who helped determine the 100 greatest American speeches of the 20th century. Dr. Haven has appeared on public radio, public television, and since 2010 has been the resident political analyst on NBC 15 TV in Madison. Please welcome Dr. Dick Haven. Thank you, Carrie. Can you all hear me all right? Good, good. All right, well, uh, you know, I, I, some of you were probably alive when Dwinda Wilkie ran for president. <laughs> But my guess is that none of you had a chance to vote <laughs> because you had to be 21. My dad certainly did. Well, I would hope, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about the Wilkie campaign, and there's much I'm going to talk about, is the uh, fact that it became known as the We Want Wilkie campaign. And uh, the first time we really think of alliteration, you know, in presidential races, you had, uh, you know, I Like Ike, which involved the first television commercial uh, of note, and it was animated. Just uh, an elephant and a drum and, uh, you know, and everybody liking Ike. Well, We Want Wilkie in 1940 became a slogan using alliteration as well. And... Uh, you know, it's something that works in campaigns because people remember it. So I want to begin, though, by taking you back to 1972, because that's when I had to have a topic for my master's thesis. And my master, I was at Ball State University, and my professor said she had heard about an opportunity to look at Window Wilkie. I knew nothing about him, even though I grew up in Indiana. And, uh, and so I began to research him a bit. And she said, you want to go down and visit his son in Rushville, Indiana. His son was named Philip Wilkie. And Philip Wilkie was a student at Harvard University when his father ran for president. And so uh, he became a lawyer, like his father, and uh, lived in Rushville, Indiana. Rushville is a community uh, just uh, southwest of Indianapolis only about 25 miles from my hometown. And, so, and it's a community of about 10,000 people now. And so I journeyed down to Rushville to meet Philip Wilkie and to find out if I could research something about him. Now, I was getting a communication degree, and my professor said you should look at his pre-convention speeches because those speeches have not been analyzed. And when you do research in the humanities, you want to do something original, you know? And so uh, this looked like it had a possibilities of a topic, but I would have to find those speeches. I would need to, doing research like this, build an understanding of the subject and of the time. And it would also help if I had original documents uh, to look at. And then if I could talk with people who were actually there at the time. And finally, uh, look at the news accounts. So I drive down to Rushville, Indiana, to the Philip Wilkie Law Office. Now, what I didn't know is that Wendell and Edith, his wife, had uh, moved, uh, there, had a home in Rushville when he was running for president. Now, he was, they were living in New York City. They were pretty wealthy, but they also had a home in Rushville. That's not where he was born. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But it was interesting uh, that his son had established the law office in Rushville 
because Wendell, as we'll see, uh, wanted to be in the same law office as his parents. They were both lawyers, but we'll get to that. So I drive down to Rushville, and I walk into this law office. And in front, it's, it, it's a room as deep as this, but not as wide. And there's a gigantic table. And the table is covered with paraphernalia and documents, photographs from the 1940 campaign. As a researcher, I had walked into a gold mine, because there it was. And so what I was able to access were the speeches that he gave. You know, these were typed copies, uh, and they were available for me. They were uh, all kinds of news accounts, clippings from newspapers, everything else, sitting there waiting for me. And then I had his son, who was a 21-year-old college student at Harvard when his father ran. He would leave Harvard and help him out. Incidentally, his son, Philip Wilkie, uh, told me that he was in school with John Kennedy, and they debated each other. So different time, different circumstance. But I had Philip Wilkie there. And so I would make many trips down to the law office to spend more time on the documents, reading, researching, and talking to him. One day, he told me that his mother was coming to visit from New York City. Edith Wilkie was 84 years old. Now, I don't know if you remember, Philip Wilkie died in 1940, I'm sorry, Wendell Wilkie died in 1944. So he, you know, he died at the age of 52, or excuse me, he died at the age of 56, uh, unexpectedly of a heart attack. Edith was still alive, and w Philip said, she's coming to visit, and I've told her she has to spend an hour with you. <laughs> he made his mother sit down and give me the opportunity to talk with her. Now, this was interesting because both of them were involved in the campaign. But in the case of Edith, the convention took place in the Philadelphia Convention Center. And she snuck in and sat up in the high stands watching. So now I had a person who was there, and obviously intimately knew Wendell Wilkie. And both of them gave me that personal access that would help to also shape my research. So that's how I came to know Wendell Wilkie and to write about Wendell Wilkie. Now, for this presentation, I'm just trying to profile him. I'll make a little reference to his pre-convention speeches. Uh, you know, politics in 1940 were very different than today for president, right? And one of the difference was you didn't spend four years running. And here's Wendell Wilkie. Wilkie was a, a lawyer. He was a graduate of Indiana University. His parents were lawyers, and they lived in Elwood, Indiana. Elwood was north. Uh, east of Indianapolis, and it was and now it's about a community of 8,000. It's probably smaller then. Wendell wanted to go back and, and, and be a lawyer in Elwood, and his parents said no. They didn't think that was a good idea. You should venture out and make your own name. So they kicked him out, and he went to Akron, Ohio, where he began working, I believe, in the industries there, and eventually, he would go on uh, to move up an in industry. And the time of his, of the late 30s, he was the CEO of a company in New York City called Commonwealth and Southern, an energy, an energy holding company. So you can guess what they invested in, and why he may not be happy with a certain New Deal program, the TVA, because the TVA was a public effort by the federal government to enter into the energy business. Wendell wasn't happy. And he wanted the government out of the energy business. So in any case, uh, it's interesting. You know, he was a Democrat. You know, in 1920, he's born in about 1895, somewhere in there. Uh, he attended the uh, Democratic National Convention. 
and was you know, active in, in democratic politics. He was never a candidate, but uh, in 1935, he officially left the party. He had, he had voted for Roosevelt. He had supported the New Deal until the TVA came along, and then he became more and more disenchanted with the democratic policies. Now, he joined the Republican Party in 1939. That's what I mean about uh, politics are a bit different. In fact, it wasn't until October of 39 that he joined. All right, and you can imagine that may not have made uh, some people in the Republican Party very happy. You're supposed to belong a lot longer uh, than a few months. But there's Wilkie. Now, he emerged very quickly as a dark horse candidate. He was different. He was unique. He was also uh, dynamic. And we'll talk about some of those elements. And most notably, he had never run for a political office in his life. Mind you of anybody else? Okay. Uh, so uh, Donald Trump wasn't the first. Winda Wilkie was the businessman who ran for president in the Republican Party without having been elected to anything else. All right. Now, in 1940, things weren't going well for Roosevelt. In 38, the Democrats had lost seats in both the House and the Senate. Uh, you know, the New Deal had had a, a positive effect, but the economic situation was still kind of, you know, they'd gone back into recession, there was stagnation, and so uh, people were unhappy. Unemployment was still uh, way high, uh, taxes were always an issue, and now the big idea of big government, the government was too big and it wasn't solving the problem. You might remember that Roosevelt got into a little bit of hot water when he tried to pack the, the Supreme Court. And that flopped. So there were issues involving the, 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 behavior, the performance of the New Deal, with FDR, big government. And then there was the question of the third term. You know, George Washington stepped aside after two, and no president up to that point had ever been elected to a third term. Teddy Roosevelt, came close, but it wasn't quite really true because he could have been elected again and still be only two terms. But nonetheless, once Franklin Roosevelt said he wanted to continue, then the issue of the third term, and that would become a slogan, no third term. Don't violate George Washington, he's too special. So that was part of it. Uh, the war in Europe would become the defining issue. You know, 39, Hitler really begins to move on Eastern Europe. And eventually, by 1940, they're going into France. And the whole question of isolation versus intervention becomes a dominant question here in the 1940 campaign. Now, the Republican Party had been, since World War I, strongly isolationist. And the leading candidates in 1940 were all isolationists because that was the standard part, uh, position of the party. And you all remember who was the leading voice for isolationism in America? Lindbergh. Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh, the America First movement. And he, and he was powerful. Uh, you, know, you know, there were just millions and millions of Americans who were members of that movement. And the general feeling was no more wars in Europe, that we don't be involved in Europe. And so that's what Roosevelt was up against. But the tide was turning. And so when we move into who the other candidates were and the efforts for the nomination, we get into some of the changes that are happening. So I, don't, I, I want you to, we'll see who you know. Now, the, going from left to right, who's the guy with the mustache? Dewey. That's right. That's Thomas Dewey. At this time, he was the DA of Manhattan. He would become governor later. By 44, when he runs, he's the governor in 48. 
But right now he's just a DA, and he's 38 years old. That's young to be running for president. So he was the fresh new face of Republicans. Now, he was a crime buster. He was well regarded. And remember, in 1940, New York is the number one state. It's the most powerful state. Roosevelt was governor of New York. Teddy Roosevelt came out of New York, you know. And, and so, uh, you, you know, New York played an outsized effect on, on politics. Now, it's interesting, incidentally, you know, you, you can run for president if you're a natural born American and you're at least 36. When I was running for school board in 1986, all right, I was 36. And I went to a luncheon with uh, seniors in the park, Starin Park. And I was sitting next to a, a lady who was, she told me, she said that she was 84. And she turned to me and she said, I hear you're running for school board. And I said, yes. She said, you look too young to be on the school board. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, I'm 36. That's old enough to be president. She said, I'm not talking about president. I'm talking about the school board. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who's the next guy? Taft. Taft. That's right. Robert Taft of Ohio. At that time, the Taft family owned Ohio because William Howard Taft, his father, this is the eldest son, the former president, and the only president to become Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Powerful man. And here's his son, senator from Ohio, well regarded, but boring as hell. He was not a dynamic campaigner, but he believed because he was Taft, that he should be the candidate. Who's the next one? I'll tell you, he's from Michigan. He was a leading isolationist, and his name is Arthur Vandenberg. So Vandenberg had been one of those voices about isolation from World War I on, on out. And he would have all the Michigan delegates lined up. And at this time, like many other conventions, uh, you don't have delegates locked in the way we know of today because the primaries were only beauty contests. They did not lock in candidates, uh, lock in delegates for candidates. So that meant that particular favorite sons, Vandenberg and Michigan, would control those delegates. That makes the conventions at that time a lot more fun to watch than today. And who's the last guy? Hoover. That's right, Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover sticks around for a long time. You know, he, uh, he's interesting because he still wants the nomination. He wants another shot at FDR. And so he's one of the four leading candidates that are competing with Wilkie when he shows up for that nomination. All right, so what do we have as we go into the pre-convention campaign, and incidentally, that's Time Magazine from July 31st, 1939. Wendell Wilkie's on the cover. And at that time, that was a big deal. And that was an indication that he was garnering attention. Remember, that's before he's declared, but he is out speaking, and he's getting attention. And so people were beginning to notice him. As the campaign would get going, and all of it would happen in 1940, there wasn't much going on before that, he would garner even more attention once he announced he was running. So Dewey was a moderate in the Republican Party, but he was young, but he was the favorite of pledged delegates from the, from the uh, primaries. Now, they're not pledged for very long. They don't really have to vote for him, but they're supposedly going to be supporting him. Taft was an isolationist, popular in the son of the former president. Vandenberg, we've talked about. Hoover hoped to get another chance at FDR. He had Iowa, but he didn't have much else. He wasn't going to have a lot of support. Now, what are they all hoping for? Dewey was hoping for a first ballot nomination. And he would come in as the leader. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Taft 
Hoover uh, and Vandenberg were hoping for a split convention, and then the delegates would leave Dewey and come to them. So there are going to be battles in the convention hall. Wilkie was the maverick. Now, Wilkie was a, you know, remember, he'd been a Democrat. He would be a liberal re Republican, how they would define him. Now, that's when the Republican Party had liberals, okay? Now, who's the most famous former liberal Republican? You all know him. He was the governor of New York. Nelson Rockefeller. That's probably the last really well-known liberal Republican. And Barry Goldwater in 64 said one of the things that would make him really happy was to see the liberals kicked out, the Eastern liberals. And it came to be. They're gone. So at this time, there was a wing, especially of the Republican Party in the Northeast, that were more defined as liberal Republicans. They were often in business, and they would be interested in Wilkie because he would represent more of their perspective, and he was the CEO of a company in New York City. Now, in, in addition to being a maverick and a fresh face, he was a superb extemporaneous speaker, and this would really help Wilkie in the pre-convention campaign. They would have forums, radio debates, and he would go out and he, would, he, he could just speak off the cuff. He was more dynamic. He was more uh, in, interesting to listen to and to look at. He's a good-looking guy, and he got a lot of attention. So people began to gravitate to him because he was not so laid back like Taft and Hoover and Vandenberg and even Dewey. Dewey was not that dynamic. And uh, we can certainly see that in the 48 campaign. But in any case, uh, that was the advantage for Wilkie. Now, the convention is July 24th to the 28th, 1940. And it's in Philadelphia. And, uh, it, you know, I'll talk to you about some of the aspects that are there. But well, here's a story that came out of that convention. Uh, there was always the expectation that if you were from a state, people in that state would automatically support you, that there was supposed to be this kind of allegiance to the state. So Wilkie's from Indiana. He expects the Republicans in Indiana to support him. So one of the Republicans was a senator by the name of James Watson. And Wilkie and Watson were staying in the same hotel in Philadelphia. And Watson was talking with other Republicans in the lobby when Wendell Wilkie came bounding down the stairs. He bounded everywhere, a lot of energy. He walks right up to James Watson, the senator, and says, Senator, we're both from Indiana. Why aren't you supporting me? And the senator very calmly turned to him and said, so everybody could hear, Wendell, I don't mind the church converting the town whore. I just don't want her to lead the choir the very first night. And that was one of the problems that Wilkie had. He was viewed as not a true Republican. Now, and that's not surprising. So he had to overcome that. Now, it's interesting. The people who control the convention would have the power not only to affect who speaks and when, but also who gets to attend and sit up in the higher sections, the public seats, you had to have a ticket. And the person who was supposed to run that part of the convention died just before the convention. And the fellow who was appointed happened to be a Wilkie supporter. And so at the convention, suddenly the upper you know, there's, there are about 20,000 people in there and, and, and were just loaded with Wilkie supporters. They weren't handing out tickets to Dewey supporters or Taft supporters, only to Wilkie supporters. And the concept of We Want Wilkie came when speakers would, say, attack Wilkie. They would start shouting, 
thousands of them, we want Wilkie, we want Wilkie. And so it created this dynamic that the public was for Wilkie. So, it, you know, in politics, all is fair. You want to control what you can. And that's where someone helped Wilkie by getting more of his supporters in there. And let's remember, there wasn't television. There was radio. But people did not see it. And so what happened there was much more important. Now, on the first ballot, Dewey led with 360 delegates, uh, Taft 189, and Wilkie 105. So it didn't look good for Wilkie, but things began to change. By the fourth ballot, Dewey had faded some, Taft had 306, Dewey 250, I'm sorry, for the fourth ballot, Wilkie had 306, uh, Dewey th 250, and Taft 254. And in the end, Wilkie would be nominated on the sixth ballot. So what happened during those ballots? First of all, people were not pledged by some legal standard. They could move. At one point, Vandenberg finally releases delegates, and most went to Wilkie. And so this would begin to happen with other states. And as it did, there was a flood, and eventually Dukey, Wilkie would be proclaimed the candidate unanimously. But he had stormed the convention and taken the nomination. He was an unusual guy. Uh, and, and an unusual circumstance. Now, why did that happen? Well, Wilkie's style made a heck of a difference. His business background was very appealing to people. And he was not a typical businessman by any means. There was a story told about Wilkie. I don't think he ever drove cars. You know, uh, he, he, they said if he drove, he was always talking so much, he would drive off the road. Uh, he didn't wear a watch, but he could tell you the time within 15 minutes. He had a knack for knowing what time it was. He was interesting. Now, his interventionist stand, he was the only one of the leading candidates who supported intervening and supporting Great Britain. And by this time, more Republicans had moved in that direction. And so, at first I thought they were talking to me. Uh, <laughs> that stand helped him immensely because it made him stand out from the other candidates. And instead of the nomination focusing on normal economic issues or cultural issues, the war became a dominant concern. I think people in the Republican Party believed, the leadership, that having a candidate who was for intervention would be more positive to their chances than negative, because the mood was changing in the country as uh, Great Britain was looking at being the only country standing between Hitler and the United States. So Wilkie wins the nomination. Now, at that time, no Republican candidate had ever won the nomination and then addressed the convention. Wilkie came bounding down and addressed the convention. The heck with decorum. Now, who in the Democrats, well, I think, was the first to do that? I believe it was FDR in 1932. He flew to Chicago. All these conventions are often in Chicago, incidentally. This one in Philadelphia. But uh, he, he went in and, and he addressed the convention. So this was the first Republican candidate to address the convention. But it wasn't the official acceptance speech. The official acceptance speech at that time was always given later somewhere else. In Wilkie's case, he gave it in Elwood, Indiana, his birthplace. In August of, I think it was August 17th of that year. <clears throat> so a couple months later. Well, that's a good example of Wilkie. Forget protection, Secret Service or whatever. He's standing up and he's got some police, car, police motorcycles next to him. But all the folks have pretty easy access. Now you might remember 
This was not a typical FDR after he had been elected waiting to go into office in 1932, which means he didn't go in until March. Remember, that doesn't change until uh, the 36th election. He was down in Florida sitting in the back of a convertible chatting when a guy took a shot at him and missed. We may not have had an FDR if the guy could shoot straight. But in any case, this was not atypical. So there's, there's Wilkie. He's in Elwood, and he'll speak to, I think they had a couple hundred thousand people there. A big turnout because, hey, you don't get to have a you know, candidate for president in a major party be from your home state, let alone your little town of Elwood. So there was a lot of attention paid to Wilkie. That's Wendell Wilkie. And there's some interesting things to know about, about what happened. You, you know that FDR won the election. I'm not surprising you here, I don't think. Uh, but Wilkie, after the election, and, and one of the problems for Wilkie, and you know, he, he was not an experienced campaigner. He did not have advisors, in some cases, who had a lot of experience. And so he didn't do a real good job of campaigning uh, against FDR. Uh, the war coming helped. There's no, they, there's no question that probably voters were not uh, going to leave FDR with the prospect of war. And so uh, that would be the same case in 44 when he ran again. Wilkie, after he was defeated, though, was very gracious. And uh, especially after Pearl Harbor, he met with FDR. And they became very good friends. He became a roving ambassador for FDR and would go around the world helping the cause. He was so well regarded that Roosevelt, in a moment uh, of uh, you know, honesty, I think, said, you know, I'm glad I won in 1940, but I'm sorry Wendell lost. He liked him. Now, going into 44, Wilkie was again wanting to be a candidate for the Republican Party. And, uh, but it was clear the party had moved on from him. And he, you know, there was uh, a friction there, and so he didn't even get a chance to go to the convention. He stayed away. At the same time, there were talks going on in the Democratic Party about who should be the vice president under Roosevelt. <clears throat> Those talks would produce Truman who never had a hint that this was going to happen to him. Before they got to Truman, some wanted Wilkie. They thought Wilkie would be an ideal vice presidential candidate in kind of a unification ticket. And so he was speculated about being that person. Now, Wilkie uh, suffered a heart attack. And he, he was a kind of guy who didn't want to stop. He was always going. And I think, I forget if it was in Indiana that he suffered the heart attack, but wherever he was, he insisted on going on to New York City. And in New York City, he suffered another heart attack and then another one. They had him in the hospital. And then the, uh, either the third or fourth one killed him. Now, Wilkie was 56 years old. He was uh, a heavy smoker a heavy drinker, and didn't pay a lot of attention to his diet. So he, he certainly contributed to his outcome. But what's interesting about that is that it was the only time that the ca uh, candidates of a major party, Wilkie and a senator, I think it was Neri from Oregon, was his vice presidential candidate, both died before the 44 election, which means if they'd been elected, both would have died before the next election. That's never happened before, that both would be dead. Now, they weren't elected, so it wasn't an issue, but that's one of those odd little pieces of trivia about Wilkie and the senator from Oregon. Wilkie is famous today, incidentally, uh, uh, the Democratic Party and FDR also thought he might make a great UN ambassador once the United Nations was started. 
And so he was also talked about for that. He wrote a book called One World. That was published uh, before the end of the war. In it, he advocated for one world government. And you can imagine that was pretty radical. But that was his perspective after what he watched and witnessed in the war. Also, Wilkie came out between the 40 and 44 campaign and advocated for full civil rights legislation. He wanted, he was, even in 40, he was reaching out to African Americans, but now he was advocating that there should be civil rights legislation. <clears throat> and that's an indication, again, of being of the liberal wing of the Republican Party. So Wilkie was different. Yes, he was a maverick, very smart man, but also someone who I think had the ability to see what was going on and learn from it. And so he had that perspective. You know, he, he didn't win the presidency, but he certainly was a comet who shot into the political arena and garnered a lot of attention. And so We Want Wilkie certainly helped get him the nomination. That's Wendell Wilkie, and it was my pleasure to spend some time back in 72 talking to Edith, she was 84 at the time, to Philip, and to learning about this guy from Indiana that I knew nothing about and what he had done in 1940.